Hello and welcome to GameSack. Back in October of 2021, I did the first, last official games episode where I took a look at the final releases for several different consoles. And I did it for each of the major three regions, Japan, Europe, and of course, North America. Well, in this episode, I'm just gonna do the same thing, but with a bunch of different consoles. Now this first one up was probably the hardest one to find reliable information on which games came last. The PC Engine originally launched in Japan on October 30th, 1987 and in North America almost two years later as the TurboGrafx-16. The European market consisted only of imports. Although a version of the console was planned and made, it was cancelled, though eventually it was sold later via liquidation. However, the European market for games on this console never officially existed. Sadly, the console wasn't very popular in North America, so they called it quits first with Magical Chase. This was the last Hue Card or Turbo Chip game released here near as I can tell, and it was released in April of 1993. This horizontal shooter is sometimes referred to as a cute em up or a witch em up because you play as a witch, just like Cotton. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I prefer this one over Cotton. That seemed to upset a couple of you last time I said that, but hey, that's not my problem. This is also the rarest and most sought after game in the region, with prices going up well over five figures. Is it worth it? No, no game is in my opinion, but hey, I'm not going to tell you how to spend your own money. One of the reasons it's so rare is because it wasn't sold in stores and was only available through mail order from TurboZone Direct, who was responsible for handling the console here at the time. Anyway, you get some wonderfully colorful graphics with some superb scrolling. Even the music is catchy. To top it all off, the gameplay is quite solid, and I like being able to upgrade my abilities in the shop. This game is uncommon, even in Japan, thanks to the distributor Palsoft folding at the time of its release. The final game released on the compact disc format in North America was Bonk 3 CD in December of 1994. This is another one that had to be ordered from Turbo Zone Direct, which is how I got mine. Weirdly, it's nowhere near as rare as Magical Chase, though it certainly isn't cheap if you can even find a listing. This is basically a CD version of the Bonk 3 Hue card for the most part. I'm just surprised that it came out more than a year and a half later after the Bonk 3 Hue card was released. That being said, I don't really trust that this game came out in December of 1994, maybe 1993. I think the information that's on the internet is wrong. Unfortunately, no one seems to have any rock solid info about TurboGrafx release dates. It was never released in any other region. It's a bonk game, and this one lets you grow and shrink with different colored candies. It does add some two-player minigames, CD quality music, and fewer animation frames when you're giant bonk. I did an entire episode on the bonk game, so check it out if you haven't, and please watch it like five or six times, maybe 20. All the way through, please. Over in Japan, the final game released on Hue Card was 21 Iman, aimed to be a Hotel King on December 16th, 1994. This is a board game based on an anime slash manga. There really isn't much to say here except that you can't understand what's going on unless you know the language, and also that it probably wouldn't be that great even if you did. Is it just me or do the player pieces remind you of F-Zero? Sometimes there will be a mini game to spice things up, usually nothing exciting. This game seems to use backup, so even if you power it off, you can return to it right where you left off the next time. It does this automagically. Yes, that's a word, at least in my world. Seriously though, this game just makes me want to play F-Zero. The final game released on CD, and thus the entire platform, was Dead of the Brain 1 and 2, released four and a half years later on June 3rd, 1999. This isn't a compilation of older titles from the console put onto a single disc, but conversions of digital comics from old Japanese PCs. There's still digital comics here, but they play as point and click games. I like that the commands are in English, but obviously all of the other text and voices aren't. You might be able to fumble your way through it if you don't know Japanese, but I can't imagine it being a ton of fun like that. Of course, as you can probably imagine, the game has to do with zombies and the like. It can be a bit disturbing. Even Stephen King is rising from the grave to come get ya. I told ya, you shouldn't have buried him at the Pet Cemetery. Yes, that was my impression of Herman Munster in the Pet Cemetery movie from the 80s. 
Dead of the Brain 2 is a bit more refined in that it shows you what you can click on in any given scene, which is super nice. What could potentially be entertaining is lessened by the fact that I only know English. Still, 12 years of official support is pretty good for this console. Nintendo's Game Boy launched in 1989 and took off like crazy. Portable gaming was a virtually untapped market at the time, and Nintendo took the ball and they're still unstoppable to this day. Ten years later, on October 19, 1999, North America would be first to see the final game released in their region with Pokemon Yellow Version's special Pikachu edition. I don't know, it doesn't look very yellow, it looks more green to me, ha ha ha. This would also be the final game in Europe, but they wouldn't get it until June 16th of the year 2000. I've gotta be honest, this is the very first Pokemon game I've ever played and right here is my first time playing it. Well actually I did try Pokemon Go when it first came out. Anyway, I wasn't a kid when Pokemon first came out so it never appealed to me. This is an RPG game and what's nice is that it's no problem at all if this is your very first time playing a Pokemon game. You live in a world that's unhealthily obsessed with all things Pokemon. You get your Pikachu and he fights your battles for you because you're a total wimp and can't fight for shit. Of course, he'll be fighting other Pokemon. Personally, I just let them fight each other in the wild and go along on my way, but then we wouldn't have a game, would we? Soon, you get Pokeballs so you can capture more Pokemon. You can only use one Pokemon at a time in battle, but you can switch between them. Even if they don't all actually fight, they'll still get experience just as long as they were chosen at some point. This is a pretty good way to level up the weak characters. This facet of the game is what appeals to the obsessive compulsive among us, as such players will want to collect them all as they say and get them nice and tough. As a game, I think it plays well and it's enjoyable. It is aimed a bit at the younger audience, and that's fine. One thing I really like is that you can save almost anywhere and anytime you want. The visuals are pretty basic, but during the battles your Pokemon is all blocky looking just like Mode 7 graphics on the Super Nintendo. Who said the Game Boy is allowed to do this? Stop it Game Boy, only Super Nintendo can be blocky! The music is okay, though it defaults to mono. Overall, not a bad game at all, and I liked it more than I figured I would. This is a good way to end such a great portable. Japan would be the last region to get a new Game Boy game, and it was actually two games. I'm gonna mangle these titles here, but they're called Gokaku Boy Gold, Shikakui Atama o Maruko Kaizen no Tatsujin. Send your complaints to the manager. The other game has the same name, it's just Kanji no Tatsujin. These were released on March 30th, 2001. As you can probably imagine, these games have lots and lots of Japanese text. They're basically just word and letter games in Japanese, so you won't find much here unless you're in the process of learning the language. There's really not much to show you with these, but this is how the Game Boy ended. Or did it end there? On June 28th, a game called From TV Animation, One Piece Mabaroshi no Grand Line Buokenki was released. As you can see here, it's clearly a Game Boy game. Well, kind of. It's technically a Game Boy Color game, but this was the final title release that featured a regular-ass Game Boy backwards compatibility mode. So I say that this one counts, at least somewhat. Anyway, this is an RPG based on the One Piece anime. It's 32 megs, which is absolutely huge for a portable game. There's lots of nice artwork and there's some great music in here too. The only thing that's bad is the sound that the text makes as it draws on screen. And there's a ton of text in the game. In fact, you'll be reading more than you'll be playing. If you can read it, that is. I looked to see if this one had been translated, but I was unable to find an English version. This game looks like it could be pretty fun.
This next system I didn't own at the time because I just wasn't really interested in portable systems, even if they were made by Sega. But even I knew back then that the Game Boy was better than the Game Gear. Still, let's see how the Game Gear finished itself off. I should probably rephrase that. The Game Gear is Sega's first and only dedicated handheld console, if you don't count the Nomad, that is. It was launched first in Japan in October of 1990. The first region to say goodbye to the Game Gear was Europe with Sonic Blast in November of 1996. This is one of the biggest games for the console, clocking in at 8 mega power, or one entire megabyte. Right off the bat, you can choose to play as either Sonic or Knuckles. The gameplay is basically a standard Sonic game. It's not a weird isometric game like Sonic 3D Blast, which is completely unrelated. Your goal is to collect the rings, end the existence of any enemies that give you trouble, and navigate the stage to its conclusion. There are three stages in every zone, just like the first Sonic game, and there's a boss fight at the end of every third stage. If you take a hit, you lose your rings, but not all of them like in most Sonic games. Instead, you only lose 10, so you can actually take quite a few hits. Both Sonic and Knuckles can do the spin dash. However, Sonic can double jump simply by pressing jump when he's in the air. Knuckles, however, can't do this. Instead, if you press jump when he's in the air, he can glide down slowly. And of course, Knuckles can climb walls. I'd honestly recommend playing as Knuckles instead of Sonic because Zone 3-3 here is extremely annoying without the wall climbing ability. There are also bonus stages that you can find. These look cool for the first few seconds that you see them. Your goal is to get enough rings to reach the Chaos Emerald. Graphically, I'm not sure if I like how this game looks. The backgrounds are nice with lots of color, but the sprites are all pre-rendered and look really ugly. The sound and music are okay and fairly typical. Overall, I got bored with the game, but then again, I'm not really much of a Sonic fan. Japan was next to say goodbye with G-Sonic on December 13th, 1996. This is the same exact game as Sonic Blast, just with more G. The very final game released on the Game Gear, though, was Super Battle Tank in North America, which was released in 2001 from Majesco. This was programmed back in 1994 when the Game Gear was still available everywhere at retail. It just never made it out until nearly a decade later. I mean, seven years is almost a decade, right? Yeah, close enough. This game is fairly basic. It takes place in 1991 during the Gulf War. Your goal is to drive around and destroy all of the other tanks on the map and avoid minefields. You can simply look where you need to go on the map and then just drive there, which will take forever and you'll waste tons of fuel, or you can just move there on the map itself. I recommend doing this to save your sanity. You then have a couple of different guns, including a laser to bring down the other tanks. And their tanks are super fast too. There's not much going on here with either the visuals or the audio. I was able to get kind of into it, but I think that most people are gonna find this one pretty boring. Being released in 2001, I wonder how many people bought this. I can't imagine very many. And so ends the Game Gear. The Sega CD was first released in Japan at the end of 1991. North America was first to call it quits, surprisingly, and they did it with Demolition Man on November 15th, 1995. This is a run-and-gun based on the movie that came out a month earlier. It has side-scrolling as well as top-down segments. You can tell that this one had some rushed development to get it out on time. First of all, the gameplay is anything but smooth and refined. You don't have precise control over Stallone here. The gameplay feels absolutely chaotic, and not in a good way like Gunstar Heroes. There are bottomless pits and leaps of faith everywhere, which just shows you how little time this game had in development. Not only that, but some of the music tracks on the CD are too short, meaning they cut out and loop before the song finishes. It's like they never played the final build with the sound turned on. I mean, clearly they did not. There's also some full motion video from the movie here. Other than that, it's the same as the Genesis version. The graphics are dark, and it's often difficult to see enemies until they fire on you, which is really fun! 
At least some of the music is pretty good, at least the tracks that are completely here. Overall, this one gets a pretty big meh from me. Gotta hate that word. Europe was next, and their final game was The Adventures of Batman and Robin in December of 1995. This is a really cool driving game that will probably frustrate most people. It's far from easy or even well designed, but I still love it. This game only has driving scenes, by the way, and I think that right there will turn some people off, but not me. The graphics are incredible, with assets that look nearly polygonal in some cases. Plus, a lot of the music is amazing. There's an original 16 minute episode that you can only see here via the game's FMV scenes. The game itself can be tedious and a bit sloppy, but at least it's unique to the platform and it takes advantage of its features. The final game released period was Shadowrun from Compile, which came out in Japan on February 23rd, 1996. This version of Shadowrun is a completely different game and premise than any other version. It's menu driven, kind of like Snatcher, which means it might be pretty good if I could read it. Alas, I can't, and so far there isn't a finished translation at the time I'm making this video. At least Compile used the Mega CD scaling features for zooming the profile picture of whoever's talking. Other than that, there's really not much to say about this one. I would love to be able to enjoy it though. Say goodbye to Sega's first disc-based platform. All right, two more systems to go. Actually, you know what? I like it. Let's make that three systems. The Sega Saturn was Sega's second disc-based platform and it was first released in November of 1994 in Japan, where it saw its biggest success. It didn't find as much success outside of Japan, however. Europe was the first region to pull the plug and the final game there was Deep Fear on June 30th, 1998. This is Sega's exclusive Resident Evil killer and unfortunately it was never released in North America. It's very similar to Resident Evil, complete with the tank controls. But this game takes place in underwater bases and on a submarine. Oh no, people are turning into zombies and you need to deal with them accordingly. The ammo isn't as limited as Resident Evil and there are more living people around to make you feel less isolated. However, in many areas, you need to worry about your air, which is constantly running out. It'll start draining your life quickly if you're not careful. There are stations around that let you recharge the air as well as save your game. Otherwise, if you've played Resident Evil, you pretty much know what to expect here. The music is awesome when it plays, though the voice acting is even better. Mookie, go return Little Shark before the area is shut off. What? I told you there's a monster down there. There aren't any Jill Sandwich moments, but you do get this guy. That doesn't sound too good. Oh, definitely. It's from the air unit area. It's howling at the top of its lungs. It's too bad this one wasn't released in North America. The final game released in North America was Magic Knight Ray Earth from Working Designs, less than a month later in July of 1998. This was actually a fairly early release for the console in Japan, and it was never released in Europe. Working Designs wanted to localize and release it here much earlier, but they had a ton of issues. Apparently, Sega lost chunks of data due to a hard drive crash after the game was finished in Japan. This affected the game's FMV videos. Wait, that's redundant. Anyway, they had to find a way to reinsert some frames and audio without decompressing and then recompressing everything into Cinepak. However, the cutscene at the end of the game seems to have taken a trip to VHS and back as it's much worse than the Japanese version. Wow. 
So if you couldn't already tell, this is an action RPG. You control three different anime girls, each with different abilities. You can switch between them at any time with the shoulder buttons. You can attack with a melee or ranged weapon depending on the girl, and they also have their own unique magic abilities. There's no leveling up, and most of the dungeons revolve around small puzzles to get to the next screen. The opening of the game is extremely sluggish thanks to all of the unskippable voice work. It'll be about 25 minutes or so until you're truly allowed to begin playing the game. Fortunately, working designs removed a lot of the other voice work that happened in the towns that would have just killed the flow of the entire game instead of just the opening. They also made the enemies faster and they deal more damage too. Additionally, they added more save spaces and you can save pretty much anywhere and I always love that. The graphics are super nice with colorful 2D pixel art everywhere. The sound and music are serviceable, but nothing tremendously special. Still, it's a fun game that could use some tweaking in the action portion of the gameplay, and I'm glad I played through it. The final unique game released for the Saturn in Japan was Final Fight Revenge on March 30th of the year 2000. What a sad, sad way to go out. This game is horrendous. It's a 3D one-on-one -on -one fighter, you know, just like all the other Final Fight games. Wait, the previous games were good though. This one requires the 4 megabyte RAM cartridge for some reason, and honestly, I can't tell why. Maybe the sound effects? The control is some of the worst I've ever experienced in a one-on-one -on -one 3D fighting game. The enemy blocks just about everything, even on the lowest difficulty. It's not fun to play at all. I will say that there is some creativity in some of the special moves, and it also runs at a rock solid 60 frames per second. But that's literally the only two good things about this turd. The final actual release for the Saturn was Yukyu Ginsu Kyoku Huzaban Perpetual Collection on December 7th, 2000. However, this was just a collection of previously released games bundled into one package, so it kind of counts, kind of doesn't. As far as I can tell, these games are visual novels with tons of Japanese text and very little, if any, gameplay, aside from making a choice every once in a blue moon. But hey, at least the artwork is well done, if not completely typical. The Game Boy Color was released in late 1998, almost a decade after the original Game Boy. And it's just like the original, just in color with a bit more power. The platform didn't stick around very long, and North America bid farewell first with Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets on November 5th, 2002. This is based on the second Harry Potter movie, which itself is based on a book. The game itself is an RPG with you collecting cards, spells, and lots of other stuff all over the place. You fight monsters everywhere, and there seems to be no place that's safe. Yep, they even attack you when you're at your friend's house. Fortunately, the battles aren't random, so you can just walk around them if you want. The battles themselves have you choosing from lots of different spells to defeat your enemies. The battle system I feel could be better, as Harry's life meter isn't shown the same way that the enemies are. The scrolling is very jerky, despite the higher power of the Game Boy Color. The sound is okay, and pretty much what you'd expect from such a game. I couldn't really get into this one. Europe was next in line to end the Game Boy Color, specifically Germany with Wendy, Der Traum von Arizona. No, this isn't the German version of Wendy every which way. You play as Wendy, who is popular in German cartoons. You want to go to Arizona. I have no idea why, but you do. To do this, you need to win horse tournaments. In order to do that, you need to wander around aimlessly. Be careful because every animal is out to kill you and the only thing you can do is avoid them. 
Yeah, and definitely watch out for these killer bees. You talk to different people, but I'm at a standstill and I can't advance at all. There's no one else to talk to. There aren't any new places to explore, and I can't use the scooter, apparently. All I can do is wander around. Ah, bees! Screw Arizona, it's more fun to be pecked to death by chickens right here in good old Germany. The final release for the Game Boy Color was in Japan on July 18th, 2002 with Doraemon no Study Kanji Yomikaki Master. Once again, a Game Boy ends its life with a kanji learning device. That's literally all you do here. This is the legacy of the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. The Game Boy Advance came out in early to mid 2001. It was just like the Game Boy, only advanced. Japan was eager to call it a day and wipe the portable clean from retail releases first with Final Fantasy VI Advanced, released on November 30th, 2006. I'm playing the North American version here because I can read it. Anyway, most people know about Final Fantasy VI. It was called Final Fantasy III here in North America when it was released on the Super NES 12 years earlier. This RPG is basically a port of that game made to fit within the confines of the Game Boy Advance. And it does so very well, even though they had to crop some of the screen. The music is similar, but the sound is different. There's definitely more hiss now thanks to how the Game Boy Advance does sound, but it still sounds great and the music is amazing. This is a fantastic RPG, even if I sometimes don't like waiting for my gauge to fill in battle so it can actually do something. The final game in North America was Samurai Deeper Kyo, released on February 12th, 2008. In this one, you can choose from a few different samurai and they'll get their own story. Don't get too excited though, as the stories aren't that different and you'll play through the same game regardless. Between the talky talky segments, you play an overhead hack and slash action game where you get to slice up a bunch of enemies. This isn't too bad, but it could certainly be better. It gets kind of boring killing so many of the same enemies again and again before it lets you advance to the next screen. After that, there are more story scenes. The story itself is kind of nonsensical and uninteresting, but everything is well drawn. I can't really recommend this one, but it could be worse. final game release for the Game Boy Advance and also the final game in this episode is 2-in-1 Columns Crowned and Choo Choo Rocket. This was released in Europe on November 28th, 2008. As you've probably guessed, this cartridge has ports of two Sega puzzle games. Columns Crown has you trying to find the jewels for Princess Dazzle's crown so she can be a queen. Why do puzzle games need stories? Anyway, what can I say? It's Columns. It looks and sounds decent enough, I suppose. Though it is kind of jarring how the screen reacts when you successfully match up some colors. Maybe this will be the last time I have to play Columns on GameSack? No way, I bet there are many more versions out there. Choo Choo Rocket requires a bit more brain power. Basically, there are rodents on the floor and you need to direct them to the traps. Or rocket ships, I have no idea. You place arrows on the floor and they dash around and they'll obey any arrows that you place. But each stage only allows you so many arrows, so you need to figure out how to get the rodents to where you need them to be. It's kind of fun for a bit, actually. It's not a horrible way to end the life of the Game Boy Advance. And there you go, the final games for seven different platforms. Now I'm not sure, but I think I might be able to squeeze out one more episode without delving too far into the boring sports and shovelware categories. Anyway, which of these platforms do you think ended on the best note? How about the worst? Let me know, and in the meantime, 
Oh yeah, thank you for watching GameSack. Don't like those annoying price tags on your games? Well, you can get them off easily with Gugon. Check it out. Hmm. High price tags will often take a bit more Gugon. Ah, there you go. Hmm, smells good. It even looks delicious.